Welcome to the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Right this way. Your therapist will see you shortly. In the meantime, sit back, kick your feet up on the couch, and get ready to focus on adding very valuable tools to your marriage toolkit. And now your host and marriage counselor, David Taylor. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What's up, guys? My name is David Taylor, and I am your host. I would like to first welcome you to the Marriage Counselor's Corner podcast. Welcome if you are brand new. Where have you been? (laughs) And if you've been one of my regular listeners, thank you for stopping by again. I really appreciate it. This is episode number 18. And in today's session, I have a lot of information to share with you on a very important, very practical, very tangible approach to conflict resolution. So in a minute, I'm going to dive right in because I have a lot of stuff to cover. But before I do that, let me just say for all of you newbies, welcome to the Marriage Counselor's Corner. This is the place where you're going to receive credible and tangible marriage-related information from a licensed mental health counselor. Now, over my past 19 years of clinical experience, I've been doing some research and studying and working in the field and reading and writing, and I've been looking to find the solution to healthy marriages. What makes healthy marriages work and what makes unhealthy marriages not work? I've been trying to find that out, and I believe I've discovered some things that will work to make your marriage healthy. So do me a favor and see these episodes as a masterclass in marriage where I take a psychological and practical approach to marriage education and enrichment. Now, in today's episode, episode 18, I'm going to be introducing a very important conflict resolution technique that you can begin using today. Yep, that's right. You know that argument that you and your spouse just had last night and y'all ain't talked about it? Well, I'm going to give you a skill set, a tool, a resource that you can leverage today, right after you're done with this, Go take this tool and apply it in your situation, okay? And we're going to call this the 5 to 1 ratio. Now, whether it's about not having enough sex or the dirty laundry or spending too much money, conflict is an inevitable part of anybody who is married. You're going to have conflict, okay? (laughs) It's inevitable. And how you manage conflict will often be the difference between whether your marriage is happy or unhappy healthy or unhealthy, smelling good or musty, because some of y'all's marriage is musty, and it's because you ain't using the right tools to help make it smell good, okay? Now, (laughs) I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and in order to help you guys understand the difference between happy and unhappy couples, I will reintroduce someone by the name of Dr. John Gottman. So you guys should know a little bit about him, but you also can just go to the Dr. Gottman Institute or the Gottman Institute to learn all about his research and what he's been doing. But he's been doing longitudinal studies on couples since the 1970s. And if you if you guys don't know what a longitudinal study is, it's just a long term study, meaning this is not a study that lasts for 30 minutes or for a couple days. This is a study that lasts for decades. He's tracking progress and regress in couples for decades, and he's looking for certain things. Now, with this particular research that I'm going to reference today, these are things that I apply with couples that I work with as well. So it would only make sense to share this stuff with you guys here. So take some notes, okay? Get your pen and pad out. Let's go ahead and dive in and talk about the biggest difference between happy and unhappy couples. So with Dr. Gottman, He asked couples to talk about a specific conflict in a relationship. And he said, do it for 15 minutes. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to observe. But I want to see what you guys do. Right. So he, he would just have them bring up the most recent conflict and see what happens when they were talking for about 15 minutes about this particular conflict. And after carefully reviewing the tapes, because he would record these and he would record the body language. He would record the verbal expression. He would record everything. And then he would sit back and he would look at these tapes. Um, And then he would follow up with these individuals, right? And again, some of these were long-term studies. Some of these weren't. But in this particular one, he would follow up with these couples just to see, let, let me see if 
what I'm evaluating is accurate over the span of five years, nine years, 10 years, right? So he would follow up with them. And what he was able to see was he was able to predict with high accuracy. When I say high, I mean like 90% accuracy, whether or not this couple will be together once he followed up with them in nine years based off of what he saw in that 15 minute conversation. Okay. So this is real deal stuff. What he discovered was something very, very simple, but not easy, but it was simple. And he he discovered that the difference between happy and unhappy couples is the balance between positive and negative interactions during a conflict. And he actually said that there was a very specific ratio, something that he found, a theme that he found, a ratio that he found makes love last. Now, Dr. Gottman began doing this longitudinal study, like I said, back in the 1970s. And now, again, you heard me reference this ratio earlier, but he found that there was a magic ratio that would help ensure that the conflicts would go well and thus ensure that the relationship would last long. This ratio was five to one. Now, let me explain a little bit about what that means. So the five to one ratio means that for every one negative interaction during a conflict, a stable and happy marriage has at least five or more positive interactions. So for every one negative interaction during a conflict, the healthy couple would have at least five or more positive interactions. Now, I want to talk about this here in a minute and explain what I mean by negative interactions and positive. But I want you just to keep this in mind that there's a ratio. Research have shown that if you do this one thing, it can improve, drastically improve the long term success and viability of your marriage. This should be something that everybody's like, oh, my gosh, I need it. I need it. I want it. Right. But it's simple. It's not easy. Now, Dr. Gottman says that when the masters of marriage are talking, you know, see, see where I get this concept of mastering marriage. When the masters of marriage, and he's referencing healthy couples, when the masters of marriage are talking about something important, they may be arguing, but they are also laughing and teasing. And there are signs of affection because they have made emotional connections, right? So he says that even though there may be some conflict, there's also affection and love and laughter included in that environment, included in that dialogue. On the other hand, he also discovered that unhealthy couples tend to engage in fewer positive interactions to compensate for their escalating negativity. If the positive to negative ratio during conflict is one to one, meaning for every one negative, there's a equal positive, that's unhealthy. And it indicates a couple teetering on the edge of divorce. Now, for the duration of this session, I want to highlight for you what exactly a negative interaction is, as well as what is considered a positive interaction. And and that way you can avoid using those things that are negative and incorporate, intentionally incorporate those things that are considered positive. Okay. So again, before I go there though, just understand there is a ratio and it's not one to one, right? It's not even one to two. It's five to one. This is a discipline. You have to wrap your mind around this because I've noticed that a lot of people, and listen, I I get to see this firsthand in in session. A lot of people, when they're upset, they're all negative. There's no laughter. There's no smile, right? Even the Bible says, be angry and sin not. So what he's saying is you can be angry, but you don't have to necessarily incorporate all of the attributes of anger just because you're angry. You can also love with anger. You can also be upset and frustrated and still have some positivity. As a matter of fact, five to one. Okay, (laughs) this is this is why I say it's simple, but not easy, because a lot of times we feel entitled to how we feel. You, You get what I'm saying? We feel entitled. If we're upset, we feel entitled. We feel entitled to express that feeling of being upset, that frustration, that anger that sadness, that fear, whatever the case may be. And we feel like we can't add other things inside of that space. So I want you just to think, keep that in mind first, because what I say next won't matter if you don't have the discipline of when you're upset, still incorporating positivity and love and affection. Okay. It's a discipline. Got to do it. So 
Let me talk a little bit about some examples of a negative interaction and what they may look like. And then I'll talk about some things with regards to positive interactions. And then we're going to wrap up. See, this is going to be brief, kind of, maybe. Let's see. (laughs) Anyway, here's some examples of negative interactions. So negative interactions include another predictor of divorce, which you've heard me talk about before in episode eight. So if you haven't listened to episode eight, go back and listen to that. But the four horsemen, right? When you are defensive, when you stonewall, when you are critical, or when you're contemptuous, those four things, go back and check that episode out because you do not want to include those in any of your negative episodes or interactions. And most likely you're going to be guilty of maybe three of those, hopefully not the fourth one, hopefully not contempt. But anyway, go listen to that episode so that you can have an understanding of what I mean when I talk about the four horsemen. But other examples of negative interactions also include feelings of loneliness and isolation and feelings of fear and anxiety. And also, while anger is certainly a negative interaction and a natural interaction during conflict, it isn't necessarily damaging to the marriage, which is why, again, you could be angry, but just don't give off the energy of anger as you're expressing that, right? Be angry and sin not. Um, Dr. Gottman explains that anger only has negative effects in marriage if it is expressed along with criticism or contempt, or if it is defensive. You can be angry, but you don't have to criticize them, be contemptuous, or be defensive, right? There are other ways to express anger outside of those three. See, negative interactions during conflict also include being emotionally dismissive or using body language like eye rolling, huffing and puffing, arms crossed. This can be a very powerful negative interaction. And it is important to remember that negativity holds a great deal of emotional power, which is why it takes often five positive interactions to overcome just one negative interaction. And if you think about it, That's the case with most things, right? You get your hair done and you get a bunch of compliments, but that one person is like, "Ah, did they really, I think they messed up your line in the back. Your taper is off or you got your eyebrows done, but one one of them look a little lopsided. So you can get, you know, three or four people telling you how good you look, but that one person and it throws everything away, right? Um, (laughs) So just be mindful of that. By the way, these negative interactions, happen in healthy marriages. So don't don't hear me say that healthy marriages don't have negative interactions. What I'm saying though is that they are quickly repaired and replaced with validation and empathy in healthy marriages. So they have negative interactions, but they quickly repair those. They quickly replace those with the five positives. At a minimum, usually it's up to 13. So just be mindful of that. I'm not saying you can't have negative interactions. So, okay, I gave you a little bit of an idea of what unhealthy interactions look like, and that's just really the abbreviated version. Trust me, you you know what a negative interaction is in your marriage, so um, I don't have to go into too many details with that. But what I do want to spend the bulk of my time on is focusing on a few positive interactions that you can incorporate, and I'm going to give you more than five. That way you have enough to choose from. As a matter of fact, I'll give you, let's give you eight. I'll give you eight positive interactions. And I want you to choose from these so that you can utilize these in any given negative situation. Okay? So there are a few positive interactions that you must incorporate. And couples who flourish in marriage engage in conflict differently than those who eventually struggle or break up. Not only do the masters of marriage start conflict more gently, and I may actually do a podcast episode on that at a later time, but they also make repairs in both minor and major ways that highlight the positivity in their relationship. So I'm going to give you a list of eight interactions that healthy and stable couples regularly use to maintain positivity and closeness. Now, your job when you get this, take these things down and I want you to incorporate at least five of these during a conflict. It's going to take some practice. Even if you move your ratio from one to one to three to one, listen, that's better. That's a step in the right direction. I'm not expecting that you guys are going to just start off hitting a home run every time you swing, but practice and practice some more and then practice even when you don't need to practice, okay? 
So here's one positive interaction that you can incorporate. And this is simple. The first one is be interested. See, I thought I was going to say something deep, but these are the basic things are what matter most. See, when your spouse complains about something, do you actually listen to them? Are you curious about why he or she is so upset with you? See, displaying interest includes asking open-ended questions, as well as more subtle signals such as nods, making eye contact, and timely things like, "Mm mm-hmm. We we call those minimum encouragers when you say, "Mm mm-hmm, or, yep, I hear you, or thank you for sharing. Things that will encourage them to continue speaking. This shows that you are connected to them and you're willing to listen while they are sharing with you what they're frustrated about, right? Or do you get defensive? Do you shut them down? Are you listening to respond or are you listening to understand, right? Being interested sets the tone for what happens next. Number two, which is the second way that you can demonstrate positivity is express affection. Yes, you are allowed to still express affection even while frustrated. Yes, who knew, right? (laughs) You can express affection while frustrated. Do you hold hands with your spouse or offer a romantic kiss or an embrace with your spouse when you greet them at the end of the day or when you're leaving or coming back home from work? Expressions of affection can also happen in small ways within a conflict. So you don't have to necessarily just do it because you leave in the house or because you're going to bed or you just woke up in the morning. You can also do it during a conflict. Imagine that. Like if a couple is in my office and I see them having a conflict, which I sometimes want them to do in front of me so that I can kind of look at it and critique and help and guide them. Often, if I notice that they got the pillow, one you know, one of the pillows on the couch in between, I'll, I'll make a comment about that pillow. I'll say, it looks like this pillow is dividing you guys. Is there a way for you guys to bridge the gap? And I'll even encourage them and recommend that, hey, put your hand on the knee, hand on the wrist, hand on the shoulder, hold hands, make eye contact, right? That way there's still affection there while you guys are having this conflict. See, within conflict, displays of physical and verbal affection, it actually reduces stress. It does. And if you're having a difficult conversation with your spouse and you take their hand and you say something like, you know what, this this is really difficult. I, I see how difficult that is, this is for you. I really love you and I know that we can figure this out together. Guess what? They're going to feel better because your display of affection is bound to reduce the tension that's dividing you guys. And that connection, when you just reached out to them and made a simple bid without, you know, it becoming about sex or anything, guess what? It brought y'all closer. So express affection. Number three, demonstrate that they matter. Yes, I know this is basic, but demonstrate that they actually matter to you instead of it just being about you getting your way or getting your point across. See, their motto for making marriage last is small things often. See, it's the small acts that demonstrate that you care. And those small acts are a powerful way to enhance the positivity in your marriage. Just simply demonstrating that their point matters, their emotions matter, how they feel matter. Bringing up something that is important to your spouse, even when you disagree, demonstrates that you are putting their interests on par with yours. And it shows your spouse that you care about what's important to them. And how you treat each other outside of conflict influences how well you handle your inevitable disagreements and you will have disagreements. So if you're accustomed to demonstrate that they matter when there is no conflict, then it will be easier to demonstrate that they matter during a conflict. For example, if your spouse is having a bad day and you stop to pick up dinner on the way home, you're showing them that they are on your mind. And that small gesture if you do it enough, accumulates over time and will provide a buffer of positivity in your marriage so that you don't enter into a conflict on E, right? It will be easier to engage in a positive interaction if you've been consistently feeling this and incorporating this habit. That way, when you do it in a conflict, it's bound to outweigh the negative, okay? Hopefully this is making sense. All right, let's move to number four. This is another good one. It's similar to number three, but it's a little different. Be intentional about your appreciation of them. 
How you think about your spouse influences how you treat them. Now, by focusing on the positives of your marriage, such as the good moments from your past or the good things that you admire about your spouse, their traits, you put positive energy into your relationship. And emotion is comprised of energy. So is intimacy. So is any other thing, any behavior, any thought. All of that is energy. The Bible says it this way. You reap what you sow. Whatever you pour in, whatever you plant, it reproduces after its kind. And negativity is bound to enter your thoughts, especially during a conflict. So intentionally focusing on the positive, intentionally focusing on what you appreciate about that individual, about your spouse, will counterbalance any of the moments when you struggle to find something good about your spouse. So if you're being intentional about focusing on the positives, that will help counteract the negative thoughts that you will be having in the conflict. Now, turn your thoughts into action at this point, right? Every time you express your positive thinking and give your spouse a verbal compliment, No matter how small, no matter how basic, you're strengthening your marriage, okay? So every time you express your positive thinking and give your spouse a verbal compliment, this is helping to strengthen your marriage. And this is how you turn your thoughts into action, right? You have a positive thought about them, then you express that positive thought to them during the conflict, okay? Number five, find opportunities for agreement. Listen, in conflict, it's going to be easy to disagree. That's the basis of a conflict is two opposing viewpoints. It's going to be easy to disagree. Your job is to find opportunities for agreement. Now, when couples fight, they focus on the negative parts of the conflict. A lot of the times, they miss the opportunities for what they can potentially agree on. Now, when you are intentionally seeking opportunities for agreement, and you express yourself accordingly, you are actually showing them that their viewpoint is valid and that you care about them. See, an alliance and conflict, even minor, can fundamentally shift how couples fight. Remember, and I, this is a thought that I can't remember where this came. I think this was, wow, probably back in 2006 or seven, And I remember I was wrestling with some stuff in a relationship and God gave me this insight and he said that how can you if you guys are one if you guys are trying to be on the same page if you guys are trying to work towards a common goal then that person is not your enemy they're your ally your job is to figure out a path forward without seeing them as an enemy seeing them as something something that you are opposing or that's opposing you okay so agreement the bible says it this way how can two walk together unless they agree An agreement creates an alliance. And when this happens, when you have an alliance, even in the face of a conflict, it shifts how you guys fight. Okay? So trust me. Try that out. Number six, empathize and apologize. This is a huge one, guys. This is a huge one. See, empathy is one of the deepest forms of human connection. And I know there's some people who wrestle with empathy. When you empathize with your spouse, you show them that you understand and feel what your spouse is feeling. And you don't have to always use words. You can also express empathy non-verbally through facial expressions, through a physical gesture, through how you position your body while you're conversing with them. But you can also say things like, it makes sense that you feel this way, or I definitely understand where you're coming from. Here's what I hear you saying, right? You can actually say these things to convey more empathy. And this will help your spouse see that you are on their side. See, empathy is a profound connecting skill that all romantic spouses can and should improve in. And there is no limit to the amount of empathy you can express. And If your spouse is upset and something you said or did caused them to be frustrated or triggered them, simply apologize. You don't have to get defensive. That's a negative thing. That's one of the horsemen. You can just say, you know what? I did not know that it hit you that hard or it triggered you that much. I am sorry. Right? You can say that. And if you could find a moment during a conflict to say, I am so sorry 
that what I did hurt, or I'm so sorry that I hurt your feelings. This makes me sad that I hurt you in this manner. Guess what? You will be providing a positive and empathic interaction that reinforces your connection with them. Okay, so this is, I'm telling you, this stuff works if you can discipline yourself to do it. Okay, guys, I'm almost done. Let me go to number seven. Number seven is this, accept your spouse's perspective. Ooh, this is a good one. (laughs) A lot of times, the mere fact of being in conflict, it kind of puts you in a position where you're not accepting their position because your position is the right one, right? And we all have been there before. Don't act like you haven't. Your your position is correct. Their position is wrong. They need to agree with your position or at least uh, understand your position or at least accept your position or something, but they got to lose theirs, right? I know we don't say that, but that's how we position ourselves. See, an approach that drastically improves conflict is understanding that each of your perspectives are valid, even if they are in opposition of each other, right? Two things can be true at the same time. You hear me? Two things can be true at the same time. Yes, I know. Something can be your way, your perspective, and their way, and it can still be true. You guys can just be looking at it from different angles. See, while you may not agree with your spouse's perspective, letting them know that their perspective makes sense will show them that you respect them. One of the best ways to do this is to summarize your spouse's experience during a conflict, even if you disagree. And I call this looping. And when we do our marriage workshops, guys, I'm telling you, I'm so excited about this. When we start our marriage workshops, where we're going to be live and you guys are going to be tuned in and watching and part of the actual workshop with us, we will be role playing these things to you so you can actually see what something like looping looks like. Okay. But in in the meantime, just hear what we're saying now, hear what I'm talking about and See what you can do to apply this. If you have questions, reach out to me. Remember, validation doesn't mean agreement. Hear me clearly. Validation doesn't mean agreement. But it does signal respect. It doesn't mean you have to agree with their point of view, but it does mean you have to demonstrate respect. Okay? All right, number eight. This is the last thing. These are just eight things, eight positive interactions that you can have to balance out the one negative. Number eight is simple, but it's probably the most difficult one to do and confusing. You ready for it? Number eight is make jokes. Mm. Yes, make jokes. See, playful teasing, silliness, and finding moments to laugh together, it eases the tension of a heated conflict. See, most couples have inside jokes that only you and your spouse have. And if you could use those strategically and in a timely manner, oh my gosh, it goes a long way. This highlights the exclusivity of a couple, right? So if you have your inside jokes and you know there are certain things that y'all joke about with each other and you can jab one of those in inside of a conflict and you do it with the right heart and in a respectful manner, oh my gosh, it works. This is one of the strong suits I would say between my wife and I is that we don't take life that serious. Now life is serious, right? (laughs) But in a conflict, like very, very rarely. Now we don't even really have the drop down loud arguing matches because Mandy's not like that, which has helped me to grow and evolve as a man, (laughs) not to be like that. Uh, But we don't have those conflicts where, you know, we're upset overnight or we go to bed and then we wake up and somebody got an attitude and we walk around not saying nothing. Usually we may have words and it may last five minutes, 10 minutes. And if I see his lingering or she sees lingering, one of us is going to say something petty. Like, so you're going to just walk around tight booty. (laughs) Okay. I'm sorry. It's it's a joke, but the... (laughs) I know I was a little free with y'all, but you get the point. You know, you, you're uptight. Now loosen up a little bit. Okay. It ain't that deep. One of us will say something like that. And inevitably the other person is going to laugh. They're going to smirk or I'm prone to go and poke my wife in the, in the ribs. Right. And that just, or I'm walking by her. She walks by me and I stop and stand and I don't move and, or I lean my weight all on her. Right. Something like that. We're prone to be petty, but in a positive way. We got that positive, positive pettiness (laughs) and it works. It, it softens, 
and decreases the tension. It eases the tension and the disconnection, and it helps us to connect in the moment. And it also demonstrates that, you know what? This ain't even that deep. It ain't that deep, right? So again, just be mindful. Have some playful silliness there. You don't have to always be so uptight. You don't have to walk around puckered. <laughs> Stop puckered. Don't be puckered, right? It, it sometimes just drop the shoulders, breathe, exhale, release the tension. And that goes a long way, okay? Now, with this, before I wrap up, a word of caution is remember to find a way to joke and tease and be silly in a manner that still respects and appreciates your spouse, right? You don't want to do it in a way that makes them feel less than or demeaning or even in a contemptuous manner. You're not bullying them. You're not teasing them to make them feel less than. You're actually doing things that you know will help bring them love and affection and joy and lighten up the mood, okay? So do it in a way that's respectful. Don't do it in a way that's going to actually poke and make things worse. And if you notice that humor just ain't working, don't use it, okay? Some folk just want to be mad. Y'all just want to be puckered. You just want to be uptight. And that's, you know, I'm not going to say that's fine because you need to really, you know, settle that and improve in that area. But sometimes people just want to be mad when they're mad and you got to give them space. But remember, there is a way to make conflict work for you. And this five to one ratio is something that if you're mindful of, if you're disciplined about, it will work. OK, so don't walk around being mad just for the sake that y'all, of y'all having a conflict. You can actually change how you react and respond in those moments. OK, so let me wrap up here. Let me because oh, I can go further. But some stuff I just got to hold on to and wait until our marital workshops. Uh, but let me ask you guys this question. Is your relationship unbalanced? Are you guilty of using more negative interactions than positive interactions during a conflict with your spouse? Well, to better figure this out, here is what I want you to do for your action item over the next week. First, I want you to observe how you and your spouse interact, especially during a conflict. And for every negative interaction that happens, are there more positive interactions or less positive interactions? If there are less positive interactions, I want you to take it upon yourself to create, intentionally create more positive interactions in your relationship, especially in a conflict. And I want you to try to notice the small moments of positivity that currently exist. Like look outside of conflict, look at the positive moments that currently exist and see if you can replicate those inside of a conflict, right? And focus on looking for missed opportunities for positive interactions during a conflict. And trust me, there will be something that comes up during the week, because it always does, where you will have an opportunity, an opportunity to implement the five to one ratio. And then if you are feeling froggy and you feel like you really want to be a teacher's pet and go above and beyond, I want you to keep a journal for one week. And I want you to write down or take notes of the positive interactions, however small, in your marriage. And as Dr. Gottman's research has revealed, the more positive interactions and feelings you can create in your marriage, the happier and more stable your marriage will be. So this is something that you can do and be intentional about, okay? So let's wrap up here. And my hope and desire is that you can take this information and apply it to your marriage, okay? But you have to be intentional. You can't be entitled to how you feel. You have to push above and beyond it, okay? Especially during a conflict. And I want you to keep me posted. Let me know how this goes. Reach out to me, ask questions, send me emails, and I will be here to help you every step of the way. So let's wrap up here and please feel free to reach out to me with any of your questions, concerns. Um, feel free to leave a positive rating and a positive review. I actually didn't get to reading one today. I apologize for that. I completely forgot about that. But just submit to me any of your positive ratings and reviews, and I will make sure that when I remember <laughs> to read them live on air. So it looks like I will be coming up on a break here, probably in the next week with the podcast. I'll be going on just a one week break to reprieve and get situated because my school semester is starting back up. So I want to make sure that I'm focused on that. And my dissertation is about to, oh, we're about to start that. So, um, but it looks like up this upcoming week will be a catch up week for you guys. So if 
a live episode is not released. That just means that you guys have an extra week to catch up with all of the missed episodes that you have not listened to yet or that you started but you didn't finish. So be on the lookout for that. If I'm not giving a live episode, it ain't because I have stopped. It's just because I took a break, okay? Anyways, thank you guys for joining me on episode number 18 of the Marriage Counselor's Corner podcast where we talked about the five to one ratio, which is the biggest difference between happy and unhappy couples. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Otherwise, you will see me in episode 19, where we will discuss another information packed episode. Until then, be smart, be safe, be strategic, and I will talk to you guys soon. Deuces. Thanks for stopping by for your seat on the couch at the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Remember, Go to marriagecounselorscorner.com to schedule your next session. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss a session. We look forward to having you back on the couch soon. Bye-bye now.